All right, all right, just in time. How about that timing there? We're gonna get just about straight to the action here. Whoops, let me start it over again because I'm really good at my job. Welcome, welcome. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. We are gonna be watching some hot King of the Hill action. For starters, we've got Rubber Duck of War taking the Lizardmen versus Hadriz Dark Elves. So let's get straight to the builds. Without further ado, for the Lizardmen, we're going to be coming in with a Slon Mage Priest with High Magic. He's got Apotheosis, Hand of Glory, and Tempest. Forward of Sotek, Source Warriors with Shields. We've got Umbral Tide and another Salamander Pack. A Skink Cohort, some Cold One Riders in the back, including one Spear. And, uh, yeah, very interesting. Actually, is that... Uh, is that a Razor Dawn? Yeah, Razor Dawn, two Salamanders. So definitely going for more of a skirmish-oriented build. He's also got a Source Scar Veteran on foot. Hidden in the woods here. Or no, on a cold one it looks like. And Source Warriors with shields. <laughs> oh yeah, perfectly timed. Um, meanwhile, for the Dark Elves, going to be led by Marathi on foot. Also got a Canine Assassin and a Death Hag up on her cart. We also got a Charybdis and the Chill of Sontar. Good chilly boy. Uh, yeah, some spears, uh, Dark Riders with crossbows, and a Scourge Runner Chariot and Aristodemos. This map choice is dedicated to you. Um, this map is actually pretty balanced, I think, but it is also very strange. Definitely has some interesting terrain all around, so we'll see how the players kind of cope with this one. Definitely uh, kind of makes bolt throwers a little bit out of the question. I mean, deploying on this side, like, this is the only real high ground position you have that could even, you, you might even be able to attempt bolt throwers, and even still, like, if your opponent uses the central mound right here, screen their advance, either coming, you know, over or around on this side, which granted is still a long way, you'll still get some pretty good targeting opportunities once they come out in the open, but if they kind of hug this thing tight and come up and around, you can actually rush like, this ridge over to this ridge very quickly, it's not that big of a distance. Or, you know, coming up and around the side here. You can kind of work these forests over on the side as well. So, definitely an interesting map. <laughs> What's up, David? See ya. Yeah, it's good. It's it's decently well balanced. Got some interesting terrain features. So, we're going to give it a shot here today. Makes me want to drink another cup of coffee, right? Right? You know, I, I actually, maybe I'll put together, we can do like, if you would be interested at least. I, I might be interested in putting together a strange maps tournament of maps that are, like, maps that I think at least are balanced, but are also at the same time asymmetric and have some interesting terrain features. Um, yeah, maybe I'll put together, uh, maybe for my next Banner Cup, I'll put together a map pool that's sort of Aristo-inspired. Maybe I'll ask you for some, some maps that are well-balanced, but also, you know, have some interesting terrain features. The one thing I'm not a big fan of is choke points. That kind of forces the batter into a little bit of a linear path, which I'm not really the biggest fan of. But a, a, a table like this, or a map like this, that's got, you know, a few impassable tree pieces kind of scattered around throughout the center... Uh, lots of forests and hills, but at the same time, it's pretty well balanced, so. <laughs> it has very little high ground, yeah. Yeah. Almost a little bit of a center hill rush, not exactly, because you actually have this, like, rock and statue here. Kind of rock outcropping, like, I I'm curious to know... Like, did the elves build this statue on top of the rocks, or or did, like, rocks fall from the heavens because of some, you know, event of some kind, <laughs> who knows, and kind of bury the statue somewhat? We never shall know. Perhaps, in fact, the statue is carved out of the rock itself, which would make sense. Then they kind of came in here and, like, put some gold plating on him and stuff. I mean, I don't know. You guys let me know the tale of the statue. It looks like these guys are off. The Scourge Runner Chariot's going to be wheeling around to the, out to the side here. 
Looks like, uh, yeah, we'll kind of see how Rubber Duck sets up his force, but definitely Hadris looks to be kind of swinging his main force, wheeling up and around to kind of uh, come around this side. At the same time, kind of detaching his skirmish force, force to the other side of the terrain here. Rubber Duck's kind of moving up. He may want to actually set up his line so that he's kind of uh, has this as a little bit of a, a central anchor point. Like have most of his entry force kind of face this way and still keep, I'd probably still keep like the Salamanders even and maybe like one or two Jav Skinks over on this side just to kind of, uh, you know, throw fire at the skirmish force over here. But we'll see. Adra's getting some good positioning here so far. The uh, Scourge Runner Chariots. Not damaging anything too important. The cohort of Sotek, though, popped there uh, to, what is it, not too horrible to die. I refused to die. They took some HP damage and a few losses already from those repeater crossbows, but um, it looks like the Salamanders, if they can get up in a good position. Oh, man, a nice breath attack. Oh, that does a lot of damage to those Saurus Warriors. Pretty good stuff. That's good value right there. Um, you know, you may want to think that he should wait until they blob up, but really, this Lizardman build isn't very wide at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, man. This is pretty tough here. Because of the Arc of Fire, I actually don't think the Razor Dons will be able to shoot. I guess they can now because of their Arc of Fire, but we'll see. The Salamanders are going to open up shots. The Salamander shots are slow enough that they might be able to dodge, but yeah. Looks like the Dark Riders are able to kind of wheel out of the max range there. So, interesting situation. Meanwhile, Hadris is being very patient with this other force, pushing up and around, but he needs to be careful not to get too separated from the rest of his support here. Um, like, these missile units will do quite a bit of damage, but left unopposed, these uh, Salamanders will do a lot of damage, especially to the chill. But it looks like getting a little far forward right now, Skinks are going to come forward and start to kind of break up this advance. But we'll see. It's going to be interesting. <clears throat> Not sure about car charging the Coldwind Riders directly into the chill. They certainly will be able to break up this force and at least pin them in place. And maybe that's the idea here. The Skinks also get the uh, Shield of the Old Ones, which will, of course, protect the cold ones as they're charging in. Looks like the repeater crossbows were able to wheel up and around fairly quickly, although this is bad for Hadris. You can see the, uh, yeah, it looks like the Scourge Runner Chariots might have got caught momentarily, but actually uh, pulling those cold one spear riders away will be very cost effective, but oh man, this could potentially be a bad banishment. Looks like, uh, yeah, the, pl the RNG on that not too great, and the placement was, I mean, there's not really a great placement to be honest here because the Dark, Elf, Dark Elves aren't too blobbed up. Yeah, those cold ones are getting wrecked pretty quick, but at the cost of a lot of HP for the chill. We'll see if that ends up being enough. Oh, this is nice. Here we go. This Canine Assassin gets in here, pops his web of shadows. That will do a lot of damage and pick off uh, quite a few unit models from these Razor Dawn hunting packs. And even the Saurus uh, Scar Veteran, he has the Assassin's Trophy on him right now, so he's really honestly not going to do all that well. And following up immediately with a Soul Stealer from Marathi. Oh man, that's brutal. Brutal single target damage, going to strip away tons of models from all of these powerful ranged units for the Lizardmen. And that's going to be quite a bit of value down already, unfortunately, for the uh, Lizardmen. Got into a little bit of a tough situation there. Yeah, it's tough. Um, the Dark Riders with the speed, they can kind of outmaneuver your shots a little bit. One benefit of Razor Dons is if, at least if you get them out in the open, their missiles do travel a lot faster. Now, when they're shooting in an arc of fire, they still do travel relatively slowly. I don't know, in this situation, like, you might have had to try and get them out on this open ground right here, but there is kind of this rock anyway, so... Tough situation, uh, Cold One Riders charging in, the, uh, with the Murderous Prowess active, actually, the... Repeater crossbows might do okay there. Um, but yeah, Sora Scarvet having to pull away. The uh, Most of the Lizardman infantry is done for. We've still got the Slawn in relatively good shape here, but the the Tempest obviously wasn't overly useful here. Um, Hadris understanding that that is a big danger in this matchup, you know, getting Tempested and kind of blasted by ranged units. That definitely seems like uh, that's what Rubber Duck was going for here, but instead countering with kind of a Monster Mash ground build a little bit. Marathi as an anchor point, which I like quite a bit, to be honest. Like, this is a not a build you see super often from Dark Elves, but it is one you have to account for, definitely. Marathi will get beat up by Saurus, you know, on her lonesome after a long time, but at the same time, Dark Rider's charging in there. She's got the support of all these monsters nearby. She'll be just fine. We're quickly moving towards army losses for the Lizardmen. Statue of Sigmar map? Oh, no. No. No, like the Empire Minor Settlement battle map or whatever it is, I think. That's what it's supposed to be. Yeah, no. Sorry. 
Blizzard men are actually hanging on here for a surprising amount of time, but I'm pretty sure it's mostly just the court of Sotek. Yeah, there goes the army losses, and now it's just the last of the lizard boys. Giving them an honorable death. I say honorable. It's really just getting run over by this haggard witch cart here. These crazy ladies throwing their daggers. And there we go. Yeah. Yeah, on this map it works pretty well. Definitely works pretty well. And I honestly think Rubber Duck maybe had the tools that he wanted here. I, it's just tough. I mean, the, the high, high Priest is definitely a very competitive option. Um, I mean, of course, in this specific situation, hindsight's twenty twenty, but a uh, uh, net, like a light mage, might have been better. You could have got nets for netting down the range stuff, and then you have attack and defense buffs as well um, for your, your skinks and your source and so on. But yeah, <clears throat> it's an interesting one. Going pretty heavy into the ranged units here. For myself, I usually only take two hunting packs rather than three. But yeah, good game. Yeah, yeah, the map definitely limits some certain things. I mean, the Lizardman build, like, it was relatively narrow. I don't think that was a bad thing, but I probably would have cut... Uh, it's hard to say. I probably would have cut the... Honestly, I probably would have cut two of the Salamanders, replaced one of them with a Razor Dawn, and then the other points, I would have probably upgraded the Scarvet to have a Carnosaur, maybe? Maybe? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that that's a good point, Aristo. Yeah, for sure. The Hadra's positioning, too, kind of wheeling up and around... Um, that was, a, that was a pretty good play there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, let me get my next competitor lined up here. Um, okay, let's see here. Looks like we've got a move hacker up next. <clears throat> All right, got the password and everything sent out there. Yeah, yeah, the Sallies, they, they were having a hard time with the Arc of Fire there. Um, and and because of the way the deployment was set up, like, uh, a couple times they were kind of bunched up. And yeah, the biggest thing was the Assassin getting in there and popping that Web of Shadows because it reduces speed as well as does really good uh, damage against low model count units. Like, that was, I think that was it really. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, I see what your build was going for. Like I was just saying this earlier, I, I definitely see what your build was going for with the Tempest and the range units to like gat down a Malekith or Marathi in the air. But um, yeah, Hadra's brought a really good counter build by not going in the air and sort of having the monster mash on the ground. An interesting one. Definitely an interesting one. Uh, let's go ahead and get the next. Map locked in. We'll go for uh, Doc Cross is a little bit of a common one. Let me think through these maps here. I guess I could look at your list. Maybe, maybe we'll kind of mix it up. Do do one boring map, one good map. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Oh, uh, there we go. All right, all right. <clears throat> yeah, we'll do this one for this round and switch it up for the next one. Yeah, that's true. Hadras is a beast, absolutely. Um, I I am not playing in the next faction war, no. Yeah, I'm I was considering trying to get in playing the green skins, but 
I think I'll wait on that. Okay. Alright, looks like we're gonna go... Chaos versus Skaven, which is definitely an interesting matchup. Probably gonna see a wild Big Bird here. And, uh, you know, on the flip side of Big Bird... Go ahead and cue some music back up as well. There we go. Um, on the flip side of Big Bird, I actually think that the Skaven Master Assassin is kind of underrated in this matchup because he actually has a negative missile resist ability that you can use on Big Bird. Then you can actually shoot him down. Um, it actually works okay. Like, you have to be a little bit careful because he can get actually killed by Big Bird pretty easy in melee because he relies primarily on his physical resistance, right? And Big Bird dealing magic damage can be a bit of a problem sometimes, but... Yeah. Yeah. I don't really care too much about the prize pool, personally. Um, I mean, I already make money from my channel from Warhammer, so, like, I tend to leave those for the players who play and don't have channels as much, and so, therefore, you know, that's how they make their money from the game, but... I did get, uh, <clears throat> have to be famous to get in, <laughs> I did get, uh, what, second when I was representing the Empire, and for me that was good enough, like, like, I mean, I obviously would have liked to have won, don't get me wrong, but considering the competition I was up against, and, uh, you know, I just wanted to represent the Empire well at the end of the day, right, so, for me that was a good time, but... Cool. Looks like these guys are getting going. Like this quick downtime between games. Um. Da -da -da. All right. Here we are in the Badlands. Man, I'm a big fan of the Badlands and Orc stuff in general. Look at this little totem thing. Awesome. We got this, I don't know, whatever this thing is. Some geothermal vents. Got some, some little gobos growing right here. Some little orcs and gobos growing up. They're going to be big, strong boys one day. Right here and right here. We got some more, right? Got some more, like, down here. So, yep, that's where our green skins come from, if your mom and dad never told you about the, uh, spores and the mushrooms. It was not part of the great plan. <laughs> yeah. I honestly... Yeah, I'm really hoping that we get some kind of green skins DLC soon. I know it's been teased by CA for a while, so I'm very much hoping that that's not too delayed by the current circumstances. But let's focus on the uh, battle at hand here. We've got Dark Elves, actually, for uh, a move hacker here up against the Skaven. So let's take a look at Hadra's Skaven first. Looks like a Lord Skrulk. Got Poison Wind Mortars, Warplock Gizales, uh, Rat Ogres, three of them. It's like two Gutter Runners, one with Poison, one without, a Warp Grinder, some Clan Rat Spears, uh, yep, and some Skaven Slaves. So, pretty good stuff, pretty standard stuff. Uh, on the flip side, two Manticores and Chill of Sontar. We've also got a Shor Sorceress of Shadows. And a Sorceress of Dark, Supreme style. So, two casters. We'll see how that works. Uh, Dread Spears, Witch Elves, and, of course, Slanesh's Harvesters out on the far side. Dark Riders on the low ground. Interesting. Here's to see about this double caster build. He's got, uh, what has he got? Soul Stealer. Just Soul Stealer and Arcane Conduit. So, that's a very cheap kit on the horseback. And then up in the air... 
the sorceress actually doesn't have any spells, so she is purely just to be a combatant. I'm not really sure about this, how cheap she actually is. That's very curious. I'd have to look, but I want to say the Pegasus mount by itself is something like, what, 400, 500 points? If I'm not mistaken, so... Yeah, this is really interesting. Really, really interesting. <clears throat> We'll see how this goes. I don't know if he actually meant to bring any spells there, or if it's supposed to be completely spellless, but... It does have three flying single entities. And I don't think... Does he have Howling Warp Gale? He does have Howling Warp Gale, okay. That does mean the Gisales should be able to kind of crowd control along with that Howling Warp Gale. Of course, Skrulk also has good single target damage with his Libra Bubonicus. And his Rod of Corruption will do multi-target damage, so... Let's see. Kind of how it unfolds here. What targets the, uh... Zales start to shoot at. Blades of the Blood Queen are going to be an interesting choice as well. Missed that in the front line. Do a lot of damage. Looks like the Gisales are going to open up on Witch Elves, and man, they do a lot of damage to Witch Elves. Witch Elves have very, very low HP, as do a lot of Elf units. So, just one volley there actually starts picking models away immediately. Um, but this is, yeah, he's got to be careful of uh, getting his characters sniped out here, his flying units. Um, the Chill of Sontar is something you probably don't want to shoot at, because it's obviously regenerating. If you can save it till the end, you can typically route it off on leadership, especially like with Skrulk's uh, contamination effect. Uh, yeah, um, well, be a court, uh, you could use your phone, or I think there's a way you can actually pop out the chat. I can't, I honestly, yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty sure there's a way to pop out the chat, but anyway, Chill comes forward, gets a great breath attack here, but those Witch Elves are already done for, that's pretty painful. And a nice uh, snare here from the Warp Grinders, granted it does burn the snare pretty early on, on just a cheap Dark Rider. Um, that is going to leave these other units to come in and basically take no damage from that Warp Quake and not be snared at all. So that could potentially end up being a mistake, but the Dark Riders do come in over on this side. Looks like, uh, yeah, they actually get themselves into a little bit of a pickle getting surrounded by Gutter Runners. And with these, uh, with these Rat Ogres and Clan Rats coming in and so forth. But here we go, Slanesh Sarvester's getting into the back line. The Manticores are also pushing back as well. There's no Howling Warp Gale here to control those, those air units, so... Uh, the Supreme Sorceress may have actually just been a complete distraction considering she had no spells whatsoever. And that is a pretty big brain play if that's the case to keep the Manticores safe and to keep, uh, you know, Blades of the Blood Queen, another unit safe. But that being said, these Mortars are continuing to rain fire. They're going to definitely cause problems here. Looks like we've got a Soul Stealer going down here. That is going to probably finish off those Gisales. And the Slaanesh's Harvester is also getting into a nice rear charge here. Uh, with the two Manticores dropping in, this is going to be a quick terror route for a lot of these Skaven units, I would imagine. But actually, the Rad Ogres coming in, doing some good damage. They do have Word of Pain on them, uh, reducing their melee attack to zero. So after that charge bonus wears off, and a beautiful Breath Attack just shredding those Skaven Slaves there. Granted, um, you know, it's a relatively cheap unit, but still trying to clear out that chaff. like that quite a bit. So some nice back and forth here. Those Witch Elves come back from route. They could potentially get back in the fight over here. The uh, Naked Sorceress down here as well. No spells. She's getting beat up by Rat Ogres, but again, might just be honestly a little bit of a distraction here. You can see the Dark Riders kind of force pathing through. Oh man, yeah. Are they going to get the charge on the Rat Ogres, actually? Doesn't look like they actually get the charge there. Uh, with that 40 charge bonus, they can do really good damage to Rat Ogres on an open field charge. Very cost effective, but for now, the Chill pushing through, and I think Hadris is going to start running into problems potentially with the chill. We'll see. Secondary Manticore is also coming back, and this first one's still relatively healthy, although these Gutter Runners are in a great Overwatch position. Likewise, the Slanesh's Harvesters have taken an obscene amount of damage here. They're basically done for. But, uh, yeah, really would like to see these Dark Riders come through, push up and around this side, and start to pressure a lot of these routing units. Keep them, uh, you know, keep the pressure up. Keep, keep those routing units routing as much as you can. 
Uh, scroll coming through with the Rod of Corruption. The Supreme Source has got to be a little bit careful. She's a pretty squishy target, but it looks like a Soul Stealer going to give her a little bit more HP and uh, do some nice single target damage. Actually, it leads to Scroll getting terrified there, which is a really, really good uh, get for a move hacker here. But we'll see. There's still kind of plenty of routing units on both sides that have come back from route, rather, that uh, haven't been routed quite yet. But Skaven Slaves just having extra bodies around is going to uh, start to be a long term problem. Um, for the Dark Elves. That being said, a lot of these range units getting routed off is good, but oh man, will Skrulk actually get finished here? He's getting frostbitten and he's getting kind of pounded by the Supreme Sorceress here. Not the best situation um, for poor Skrulky boy, but to be honest, he probably deserves it, so that's fine. Um, yeah, the Manticores have taken a lot of damage, but the fact that they're both still operational, you can see the balance of power start to turn in a move hacker's favor. I actually like this build quite a bit. It's very, very interesting. Um, having that sort of distraction sorceress, if you will, who is still alive somehow with about 300 HP. And you can see the uh, mortars throwing in kind of wherever they can. Do some beautiful friendly fire. Man, what is that spread shot? What, what are you guys doing? Somehow tag those gutter runners with poison, which is just painful. But uh, Blade to the Blood Queen also just absolutely murdering these Skaven slaves right here. Um, going to full town on them. Even though there's only, what, 29 of them left, they should be able to win this engagement pretty decisively. Over here, these Dread Spears doing a great job. Uh, Manticore does get routed off, though. Uh, Hadra is able to kind of rally the center pocket here with these Rat Ogres. He's definitely not out of this yet. There's still so many Skaven left on the field. Um, Amu's definitely got his work cut out for him trying to pursue all of these units, but nice breath attack there. Doesn't get the best contact on those gutter runners, but it does manage to frostbite them. I don't know if that means that the Dread Spears will actually be able to catch them, but if he can keep pressuring all of these units off, that's very quickly going to start to kind of skew towards army losses for the Skaven. But we'll see. <clears throat> yeah, it looks like Hadra's actually going to admit defeat there, but... Wow, quite a game. Quite a game. Some nice back and forth there, and I really like that build from A-Move. I have to say, the Distraction Sorceress, um, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Wow, yeah, that was that was pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that distraction sorceress quite a bit actually, because you're gonna have Giselles here, right? And they're gonna pick away at something high value. <laughs> so pretty good stuff. Pretty good stuff. Go ahead and get the uh, next competitor lined up. Cool, cool. And let's go ahead and get a new map pulled up. We'll do... Let's do... Excavation site is okay. It's pretty small. But it's alright. Go ahead and pull steam up real quick and just move it over here in case I need it. And let's throw down on some more music. Whoop. Super skilled, by the way. Uh, we've got uh, two matches. Yeah, two matches. Hadris took on Rubber Duck and then just lost to a move here. Oh, good stuff. This added here. Okay, and we're getting the next competitor in here. Yes, yes, yes. 
having a good time today. Just kind of hanging out. I'm probably not going to be streaming for too long. Um, like, we'll probably only get through the competitors that I have on the list, which is not too many more, honestly. We've got King of the Dead and Duke Coli. Um, and I might do one more battle after that. We'll, we'll see. But... Ducali, probably. Not Ducoli. <laughs> that sounds like a different illness. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, hopefully you all are doing well today. Holding yourself together. I'm doing pretty good. Channel's been keeping me going. Um, I've got like a week out ahead on battle replays for you guys. Because I'm trying to work on some other videos right now. So, like, I pre-recorded a week's worth of videos and uploaded them. I'm going to try and stay ahead as much as I can. Um... Over the next couple weeks, at least. But, yeah. It's been a good time. Definitely been a good time. Glad y'all been enjoying the content here. We'll keep it going. I'm going to be announcing another tournament coming up pretty soon as well. Not this weekend, but the following weekend. We're going to do a banner tournament number two. They have wronged us. All right, all right. All right, so we're going to have a coast versus dwarfs. Y'all ready for a shootout on the old OK Corral? Yeehaw! That's right, boys. We're going to have down the old shootout on that OK Corral. Boys, better get them six shooters out. Get ready. I'm sorry. I accidentally turned into a full American there for a second. <laughs> Oh, I've been playing Bannerlord quite a bit, um, yeah, on my own time. I just haven't really felt like streaming it all that much. I'm still trying to get, kind of, like, test some things, really, and, and try and figure out some different things. Um, I will be probably streaming my criminal playthrough. I figured out what I need to do <laughs> to not die, basically, in that playthrough. So, uh, we're gonna probably pick that back up tomorrow. Yeah, um, I would argue, actually, that Coast versus Dwarfs might be worse, actually. Just saying, Coast versus Dwarfs might actually be worse than Bretonia versus Dwarfs. I actually, I actually think Bretonia might have a better shot there than Coast does, so I, I'm, I question the pick of picking Coast into Dwarfs, but we'll see. We'll see. Especially against a player like Amuf Hacker, who's so strong with the Dwarfs, like, that's probably his strongest faction. It's an interesting one. They match up... The, the thing about the Coast versus the Dwarfs is... The, the Dwarfs are the best shooting faction in the game. Like, that's the end of the story, right? And the, because the Coast skews very heavily into shooting, but not quite so heavily as the Dwarfs... They do have a little bit of the monster element, but... Their monsters... Morngulls are okay in this matchup. Morngulls are actually pretty okay if you can protect them, but they do get gatted by even crossbows pretty badly. And considering that the dwarfs usually go mass missiles in this matchup, because they can outshoot the count, the coast, like you, your monsters end up getting shredded by missiles, right? So you really don't have infantry power to compete one-on-one -on -one th with them at all. In fact, like a uh, coast probably has the worst infantry in the game, I would say. Um, so you're sort of stuck in this weird position where you, you can, like, try and outshoot them. It doesn't really work very well. Um, they can just rush you, and somehow dwarfs are also faster than coast, like, infantry-wise. You do have some mobile fast attack units, but the best coast builds I've seen are ones that heavily utilize the terrain. Especially on maps which have interrupted line of sight, you can get away with using Queen Bess and not getting blown up by cannons. In that situation, then the coast, I think, has a much better opportunity. But, yeah, just in a straight-up open field shootout, the dwarfs are going to win that every single time. Is there anything I really want in the Greenskins DLC? Well, I, I mentioned this in a video I made back in January, but for me, the literally, the number one thing, I mean, besides the obvious things, like fix Grimgore, 
you know, um, fix their campaign. The biggest thing for me is a mount, an Arachnorok spider mount for the Goblin Great Shaman. And that's literally it. Like, that's the thing I want the most, right? So, <laughs> to, to give the Greenskins a monster caster lord, because we already have tons of monster caster lords in the game now. Like, that was relatively rare back when Total War Warhammer 1 came out. And they already have one flying monster caster lord, which is... Uh, you know, obviously Azag, but an Arachnorok is kind of a different tier of monster, right? Like, ultra heavy armor and, uh, and the higher HP pool, combined with the fact that the Goblin Great Shaman's got Arcane Conduit, he's got a pretty good spell selection, like Lord Littlewa does lack a solid AoE damage spell, but it's probably one of the best buff and debuff lores in the game, I would say. And the fact that you can debuff your enemy winds of magic generation is also very strong. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it would give the green skins a monster lord option that's not going to get insta sniped in a lot of matchups, right? So that would be nice. That would definitely be nice. Anyway, yeah. Have I ever played Dominions? I have not. I've seen it. I've heard of it. I've never played it. And we are pretty much ready, so let's get it going. Having a look at the builds here for the dwarfs. They've gone with a very uh, straightforward, actually, kind of rush-oriented build. Let's see. Um, lots of Dwarf Warriors, Dwarf Warriors with great weapons, very wide here, we've got Dragon Max Slayers, and Grom Brindle, the White Dwarf, I like him quite a bit, uh, Bugmen's Rangers, great pick in this matchup, regular Rangers, and Ulthuar's Raiders. As for the Vampire Coast, got a Nocti Boy on foot, and a Gunnery White also on foot, which is very curious. Um, interesting. Gunny on, I de definitely like Gunny better on the crab in, in any situation, but uh, regardless, we've got Depth Guard here as well. Looks like uh, Deccan mobs, uh, Sirens, Gunnery mobs, including pistols and bombers. Uh, we've got some scurvy doges, uh, pole arms, and a single mortar over on the far side of this hill, which is an interesting deployment. Okay, looks like he's backing it up a little bit. Ideally, what you want to do with the Mortar, which is kind of what he's doing here, is kind of hide it behind some interrupted line of sight, right? And this is what I was talking about with Queen Bess earlier. You can maybe do this on this map with Queen Bess if you deploy it kind of in this area where he has this Mortar. Um, if we check from the Dwarf's line of sight, I do think actually... Yeah, here you might be able to get a slope, like over here actually. Shooting up and over. I'm not 100% sure. I think it's maybe too low, actually, in that depression. But, um... Yeah, there's not really, like, a great angle to shoot that mortar from. Right? If we kind of look down at the ground level, you can see in the distance there, there's not really a great kind of avenue to shoot that mortar. I guess way, way over here. And the Dowie Cannon, I don't think, has that long a range. Maybe it does? I don't know. Hey, what's up, Matthew Ryan? Welcome, welcome. And there's Dawi, yes. Yeah, exactly, Hadris. Casting it from a higher angle, it makes it more effective. And also, the overcast will, because he has a higher HP pool, like the overcast won't, when you take damage on a miscast, it won't be as big of an issue. Uh, for right now, right now, with any of the, the little walk casters, because it's either a goblin on foot or on a wolf. None of them have good HP pools, so, like, you just blow yourself up trying to cast that, right? Uh, we'll see. Time for grudges. Yeah, dwarf rush builds, I think, are pretty interesting. And the, the kind of the forward deploy of the missile rush here can be very powerful. Bugman's Rangers, because the regeneration, they have great stats. They're basically the, the unit in this matchup. They're so good in this matchup. Against most undead factions, actually, I really like Bugben's Rangers. Uh, in particular, the summoning factions, but definitely against uh, Vampire Coast and Vampire Counts, both. I'm a big fan of these guys. Good melee defense. Uh, 38's 
pretty good. I mean, it's not amazing, but expert charge defense de definitely helps. And obviously, immune psychology, regeneration, stock, vanguard deploy. Obviously, magic resistance because they're dwarfs. Got a lot going on there. So right off the bat, those deckhands did take a volley. Rangers are now advancing. The Hounds actually got deployed out in secret positions in the rear, but there's not any units for them to get to, to be honest. Like, even uh, the Hounds will do okay damage on the charge to the Bugman's Rangers, but because the Bugman's Rangers punch back pretty hard and will be able to regenerate that damage, they're not actually, it's it, like, it won't be too bad, to be honest. Uh, we'll see, though. Looks like these Hounds are probably going to try to get into this little box of Rangers here. They could potentially start returning fire already, but look at this. A move gets up into range here. Let's see how the dwarfs deal with this little tower that's in their way. They're able to get some some shots in. They do get a few a few shots off. Might pick away a little bit there, but yeah, see here. Uh, hounds do count as small entities, so they won't be su subject to that charge resistance. But you can see the Dawi, they barely took two model losses on that charge, and they're regenerating the rest of that HP, right? So that's the reason why you bring those Bugman's Rangers in matchups like this. Um, they just, they're such durable units for what they are. Here we've got uh, these Bugman's Rangers in melee against deckhand mobs. They basically are probably not going to lose any unit models, especially considering they're being screened out by Dwarf Warriors now. But yeah, good stuff. Slayer's kind of staying nice and saturated in here as well. The Hounds are kind of circling like, uh, like a pack of wolves, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Nice bombardment being thrown down. It's not going to do a whole lot of damage to uh, Grom Brindle, but I might as well use it if you brought it. I don't know that I would even actually bring it here. I might just choose to not buy it, but um, yeah. The Dwarf Warrior is getting in here, and these Halberds are actually matching up okay. I'm not sure if the Bombers or, yeah, Mortars are getting involved somehow. Nice. Some beautiful friendly fire, but it definitely does some good damage to the Dwarf Warriors as well. So we'll see. This big back line of Hounds is starting to come forward, and it looks like they might be trying to force concentrate in one area. That is honestly the best way of using these guys. Because they all have 60 unit models here, you can basically come in with, like... Like, four groups of hounds is basically like two mobile, like, good charge zombies, basically. So they can come in, get a bit of a rear charge, do some good damage, actually pick off ten models, like, more or less instantly, and then pull away right away. And that's pretty good. Uh, you guys have seen me use a similar tactic if you watch my video about Archaon recently that I just put out a couple days ago. I was using a similar tactic against the dwarfs, or sorry, against the... Uh, uh, green skins against goblins is much more effective than against Bugman's Rangers, but still, Bugman's Rangers are going to be subject to that, and the regular Rangers will be even more subject to that, right? But here we go, Dragonback Slayers are able to get in, kind of get a little bit of a side charge here. And obviously, anti-large bonus doesn't really matter, but just the high attack and high weapon damage means they'll get good damage done against the Hounds that do choose to stay and fight. Meanwhile, the uh, Bombers and Corlers all pouring in their fire into the same engagement here. Oh man, those Dwarf Warriors are probably getting absolutely shredded by Bombers. That being said, the Bombers are getting shredded by uh, Bugman's Rangers. So, all is good at the end of the day. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Grombrindle does magic attacks. So, if you take Ethereal units against the Dwarfs, you have to remember... Grombrindle is a thing. And, uh, he's angry. And he's actually not an uncommon pick in this matchup. Because he has magic attacks, he can counter the Ethereal units. He has massive weapon strength and melee attack. And also a smoke bomb, so he's good against monsters, right, to a degree. Can make your entire army unbreakable, which is also very strong against undead. So, actually, Grom Brindle, very strong in this matchup. And, oh, man. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Nocti Boy better run. You better run, Nocti Boy. Gromby's coming. Uncle Gromby, very, very angry at having to kill ghosts, which is just horrible. You know, according to dwarf culture... He's going to chase down this foul vampire lord and teach him what's what. That being said, he has to be careful. This Gunnery White might start taking pot shots at him, um, which definitely would be good value for the Gunnery White. Right now, he's just feeding ammo to this mortar, which I definitely understand. <clears throat> you know, you've only got the one artillery piece. You want to keep it sustained for as long as possible. And that mortar, only 18 kills. I honestly expected it to be a little bit higher. I'm not sure exactly what it's shooting at, but... Uh, here, these Death Guard come out, emerge from the force against, these Ulth against the Ulthar's Raiders... And unfortunately, uh, I mean, these guys are fast for dwarfs, but they're not fast enough to get away from Depth Guard. Those Depth Guard probably will be able to catch them. They're going to do their best, though. Try and get out of that situation. Uh, pull back to the rain, uh, support of some other range units here. And doing a great job screening with these Dragonback Slayers. Keeping this back line secure. The Dwarf Warriors as well. 
Uh, yeah, you can see these Dwarf Warriors coming over here. Dwarf Warriors with great weapons, even. They should do okay against Death Guard uh, with a little bit of armor piercing they have. Death Guard don't have the best defense, but their, their melee attack gets debuffed by the Sirens. They're down to 15 melee attacks, so maybe they won't actually make contact there. Um, but still, Bugman's Rangers are still all very healthy. The Hound problem is definitely still a problem, though. You can see they're even doing good damage to the Dragon Backslayers, and that's very cost-effective. I, hounds, I feel like, get more cost-effective the more you have of them in a mass, to be honest. Like, I've kind of come to that conclusion lately. It needs more testing, but it definitely seems like that might be a thing. Balance of Power, all things considered, is still very close, and Grombi really needs to get back and get at these Sirens. If he has Grombrindel, has no fear as well, this would probably be a good time to pop it. Considering the Sirens are kind of getting into a bad spot. The Death Guard did get screened out by these Dwarf Warriors. So, I mean, the Dwarf Warriors will do some damage here once their melee attack's not too badly debuffed. But they are going to get cleaned up. Worthy sacrifice, though, to keep the Death Guard. And now you can see the Sirens have got themselves isolated. They do have the support of these Hounds potentially here. But with Grombi coming back to start teaching them a lesson, most of the zombie units have crumbled away as well. We'll see. The Dwarfs look to be in a pretty good position here. But it's definitely not over for the Vampire Coast. I mean, this massive pack of dogs here is still running around, although they are getting pretty low on HP and leadership, and because their leadership's so low, it is easier to make them disintegrate than other undead units, though it's still pretty difficult, to be honest. Um, and because they're kind of zoned out so far away from Noctilus, they're not in a great position for, he for healing, but it does look like they're going to be trying to pull back to that position there. These Slayers also uh, kind of redeploying here. So we'll see. Looks like the crossbows are coming forward, getting into range to start saturating this melee fight where these dwarf warriors are holding up. Focus fire from the crossbows will do enough armor piercing damage to actually absolutely wreck these depth guards, so they want to definitely clean this engagement and get away as soon as possible. The zombies do pay the ultimate price, though, crumbling away there. I mean, I guess I think it was a summoned unit anyway, but uh, yeah. Pulling back with these hounds here. Got to find uh, find some way to get, get back in this game. He does have the Sirens here still fighting, technically, as well as the Zombies. So, still filling the attacking rule. But, just kind of redeploying the rest of his forces here. I don't I really don't see how this is going to go well for the Vampire Coast, though. He does have a nice heal in his pocket. Gets a beautiful invocation of the heck there. Um, but once these, uh, you know, these units in here start to crumble away, then he will have to attack with the rest of his forces. So... Yeah, we'll see. I guess he's just trying to buy himself a little more time here at the end of the day, but yeah. It's going to be breaking the attacking rule once these crumbling units are gone, which which it looks like they pretty much are, so. Yeah, so now he has to attack here with everything, or at least with some multi-model unit. Looks like he's going to try and summon another unit of zombies just to keep fulfilling that attacking rule. Looks like the scurvy dogs might try and come up and, and sweep this little flank right here. But you see how A-Move's kind of got his forces spread. He's going to be able to get like overlapping, support, overlapping supporting lines of fire. Um, and yeah, that should be enough to take, take things down. We'll see. Dogs going the long way around, all the way up and around to try and maybe chase these Dwarf Warriors. I'm not really sure, but he really does need to keep his Hounds together. Um, I, uh, I Like, this um, this critical mass thing works well enough, but if you don't have them in a mass, they'll kind of get picked away. Um, I mean, they still have a lot of unit models, just an individual unit, right? But it's not amazing. Um, yeah, physical, I, explosion damage doesn't, I want to say it does not count as missile damage, but it does count as physical damage, yes, but you can see this is the problem, as soon as the Depth Guard come forward, um, they just, they just get mown down by the crossbows, by the massive crossbows there, and him taking his time and going up and around with these hounds might seem like a good idea, but you really just need to bring in all of these units that's at the same time. And because A-Move has the ability to kind of park up against this uh, formation here, this deep pit of despair, if you will, um, 
what it means is that the hounds can't really come in and get a good flank attack right here like they do have to go all the way around potentially so great use of that terrain there um, and the depth guard are starting to pay the price here Gromby is fighting somewhere let's see where's Gromby at here in the center Hounds do get in and get into the Rangers. Balance power is still pretty close, but a lot of that is artificially inflated by Noctilus, of course. And, uh, yeah, you can see as the, the Ulthar's Raiders kind of throw in their axes here that does a ton of damage to the Depth Guard. They start crumbling. All of the Hounds are in here. They're completely surrounded by angry Dawi. So we'll come in close, get some cinematic shots of this late game. Dwarf still throwing some fire around, throwing some quarrels and some throwing axes. Hounds getting beaten, beaten down by the brave Dowie here. A few summoned zombies still fighting as well, but the Bugman's Rangers easily slugging out a win against these pitiful shambling corpses. Even some Longbeards still mixed in here. Longbeards, of course, being immune to psychology. Just very, very obstinate units with high leadership, high armor, and defense. They are very, very tough nuts to crack. And yeah, you can see this is it. This is it. Gromby finally got his got his his paws on old Nocti Boy here, and that's gonna be the end of days for the uh, the Count Count Niklaus von Karstein, since that is your real name. <laughs> Oof, beautiful overhand swing there by Gromby. You can see the crumbling effect on Count Noctilus. And that's going to be game. Gromby is such a mean, mean duelist. I mean, Count Noctilus has 60 defense, but Gromby has 70 melee attack. One of the highest melee attack profiles of any character in the game. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, dwarves have a lot of stamina. Some are still fresh winded. Yeah, well, especially... Like, the units that are just standing and protecting the back line against the Hounds, like, they'll take a charge, fight for a couple seconds, and then just stand there and rest. And then take a car, charge, fight for a couple seconds, and then stand there and rest. So having that reserve there of Dwarfs actually helps them stay fresh into the late game. And I believe, I'm not sure, Bugman's Rangers, their liquid fortification doesn't refresh their vigor, does it? I think it's just HP. You guys will have to check me on that, but... Beautiful build from, uh, from A-Move Hacker. That's textbook Dwarfs against Coast. Uh, Grombrindle slaying the Ethereal units and Noctilus, and just having the uh, Bugwins Rangers doing the rest. 153, 172, 128, 71, and 63 for the regular Rangers, 137 for the regular Slayers, and 82 for the Dragonbacks. Yeah, you'd expect Dwarf Warriors as well, 95, 81. I mean, obviously a lot of zombies and stuff, but that's good. That's really good. Awesome. So let's get uh, King of the Dead in here. If he's still around, that is. <laughs> A-Move is slightly OP. A-Move is a very strong player. I have to say, like, uh, over the past, I would say, like, three or four months, even, like, six months, I feel like he's improved a lot. I Like, for, from my personal standpoint, like... Uh, he's probably one of the best dwarf players out there. I would say probably the best dwarf player right now. Um, I don't know. Some other some other people could probably contend for that title. But the other thing about A-Move is he, I know he's been branching out and learning a lot more factions lately and just improving his overall play. I, I've seen him beat quite a few really strong opponents lately. Uh, it's been very impressive. <laughs> taken down reasonably fast <laughs> yeah oh man i have flashbacks to marcus wet noodling and cycle charging him for 10 minutes <laughs> against chosen of the norns in the faction war oh man that was hilarious <laughs> uh oh good king of the dead crashed because he of course tabbed out so let's go ahead and we'll get uh We'll get a pretty decent map this time. Let's do... Uh, let's do... Maybe either Storm Demon or... Yeah, man, a lot of these quest battle maps are so bad. Well, for multiplayer at least. The maps themselves are awesome, but... Multiplayer... Let's do, um, 
Let's do Toothgrass Hill. That's a map. Has a very large hill in the middle. Awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, outstanding use of Bugmans. And as I mentioned at the beginning of that match, I love Bugmans in that matchup. I think in that matchup and against Co Counts, they're very good. Um, they're, I think they're even pretty good against Skaven, to be honest, if you complement them with the right units. They can be a little bit vulnerable to certain Skaven units. But, uh, like, the fact they have stock... The charge defense against large doesn't help too much, but the extra melee defense and regeneration, like, if they have to fight summons, the problem is when they have to fight stuff like Death Runners, they'll still just die. So <laughs> you just die for more expensive. Um, what makes a good map for multiplayer? For me, if the map is balanced, like, it doesn't have to necessarily be symmetrical, right? Like, the, uh, if you go back to the game, the first game of the stream, you'll see uh, we used a map that's definitely asymmetric, but in my opinion is balanced, right? And it, like, as long as it has, like, kind of similar terrain features on both sides, and one person doesn't start out with, like, an obvious high ground or, like, an easy choke point or something, um, you know, like... The map can be asymmetric, but like this one is pretty symmetrical. You, one person does have a little bit more forest on one side, which isn't that big of a deal. Um, but like, for example, like Norden is one that I personally think is balanced. Same with like Volksgrad, for example. Uh, yes. Um, so yeah, like, Volksgrad is a good example, like, Norden also, um, the one that we played, I think, is Duskwatch Plateau, um, like, those are some good asymmetric maps that are good for multiplayer, um, obviously maps that are mostly symmetrical are generally good for multiplayer, choke point maps are a no-go, uh, usually, unless you're playing in the coffee cup, <laughs> Aristodemos coffee cup, um, yeah, like choke points, uh, maps that like prevent you from outflanking your opponent, like where you can set up with uh, impassable terrain that's connected to the side of the map. Like oftentimes that can kind of lead to some weird situations. Um, you'll see, still see those in some tournaments and uh, some, some rules like the banner rules, for example, basically say that that counts as the white line. So you can't actually like if it, if a impassable terrain piece is touching the white line, then it counts as the white line. So you have to set up like a certain distance from it, right? Um, but yeah, uh, there's a lot of good maps for multiplayer that you actually don't see super often. Like I think uh, the Pit of Thorns is okay. The Steps of Isha ones are they're okay. They're not. Uh, the other thing too, uh, this is just purely from a casting perspective, not necessarily from a balance perspective, but certain maps, especially Dark Elf, like heavily forested Dark Elf maps um, in Nagaron, they have a lot of very thick forests that, and the lighting is sometimes bad to where it's very hard to see actually what's going on inside the forest. And since those maps are largely covered in forests and a lot of players you know like if you're playing the wood elves or beastmen or whatever it will be to your advantage to fight in the forest right you end up with these battles that are basically unwatchable even though they're still good battles technically and they're you know competitive and well balanced and everything but they just you literally can't see what's going on so <laughs> black arc landing secretly the best map yeah i don't know about that <laughs> Looks like we're gonna have Lizardman versus Norska, so nice thematic uh, thematic matchup for this map. Skeggy Boy is gonna be coming for those lizard trinkets. <laughs> My cat's coming to say hello. All right, all right. Yeah, I think we'll probably... I got some other stuff I've got to do today, like for my day job, for example. Um, and some other things. So I won't be streaming for too much longer. I think this might be the last battle. We'll see kind of how long it goes. If it ends up being super fast, then maybe not. But 
With Norska, actually, battles end up tending to go pretty quickly, but, I mean, it's already... I guess I've only been streaming for an hour, really, but I need to stop streaming at 12. And it's currently 11.40, so... Ulfric on a Mammoth? It can be good. You also it can be vulnerable to things like uh, Razor Dawn hunting packs. Hmm... Yeah, I actually used to really like Norska in this matchup, but I don't so much anymore. Since they actually fixed Razor Dons and they're working like they're supposed to, they're really good in this matchup. And uh, yeah, yeah there's at least in my opinion, in, in recent experience, it seems like the Lizardmen are kind of taking the advantage here. But the Norskins definitely have a lot of counter tools, and actually, I say that I played one game with Turin in the uh, in the lead-up to the release of the Hunter and the Beast DLC that was Norska versus Lizardmen, and he went with a very ranged focus build with Razodons and stuff, and I went with like a counter-shooting build with a ton of Javelins uh, mounted and on foot, and it actually worked out okay. Like, I was kind of able to hold my ground and just return fire well enough that like, Turin really couldn't get great shots, and yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, Sally's can be good. I like, I personally like Razodons a little bit better because they're better against Famir specifically, and Famir are a very common pick in this matchup. Famir are great weapons especially, but that's an interesting one. Let's see. Let's see what we got. Looks like no Razodons, but instead a Light Maid. We've got double Solar Engine, a bunch of Saurus Warriors with shields, uh, Feral Carno, and Pterodon Riders. Very interesting. I guess one of them's actually a Temple Guard, but... It's a pretty straightforward Lizardman build. Uh, for the Norskin side, we've got four Berserkers, three Javelin Hunters, Warhounds, uh, Spearmen, Skinwolf Werekin, and a War Mammoth, along with a Metal Sorcerer, and yeah, Throg leading the way. Hand of the Gods is actually really good against Throg. We'll do a ton of damage to him, but Throg can match up pretty well against most uh, monsters. For the Lizardman, he will get shredded by Solar Engines, I believe. And considering the Light Mage, it looks like he's just got Fa's Protection and Barona's Time Warp, so... We'll, I'm curious to see how this goes with the extra defensive stats of the Aura of Pretzels. These Temple Guards should match up well against Berserkers, but it's... It's interesting. I, I'm genuinely curious to see how this one ends up. Kind of both builds that I would not have taken personally. I would go in a different direction on both sides here, but actually I really like the pick of the Solar Engines in particular. And the Light Mage can be a very good option. It's strong in a multitude of scenarios, so... Interesting not to see the Nets along with it. I guess just more focusing on the buffs and debuffs. Or buffs, primarily, from him, but... Yeah, also got Tempest, obviously. She'll the old ones. The uh, Immune to Psychology, as well, will be quite nice, but... Good shots coming in. Actually going after the Berserkers. Brute to the Hound there. That is a pretty good target. Uh, they're going to be pretty powerful melee units. And if you can debuff their stats on the way in, that's that's good as well um yeah a lot of value in these shooting monsters we'll see if he's going to be able to protect them looks like he does get a hit on the mammoth there able to apply that blind debuff doesn't do too much damage um does a little bit but <clears throat> our, our uh, solar engines don't have the best armor piercing values it can do some good damage but yeah Ooh, coming in for a drop rocks potentially nope 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 those javelins gonna have to be careful um yeah, sorry, I just missed a call there. Um, uh, so the Pterodons will have to be careful of the Javelins, rather. But here comes the Mammoth, charging in the front line. It does look like uh, we're immediately going to see the Temple Guard get deployed here. And I'd imagine, yep, Barona's Time Warp, or uh, at least a Fa's Protection. Unfortunately, didn't catch this other group here at, who's fighting Throg. But, of course, much more important for the uh, the uh, these units here. The Temple Guards, obviously, don't want to take too much damage. And... Uh, 64 melee defense on a Feral Carnosaur is absolutely amazing. That blind debuff still going on the Soul Crusher there. The, the Solar Engine's providing some nice point-blank fire. And uh, here come the, the Pterodons as well. I'd like to see a drop rocks kind of on this back line here to help break up. But here comes the Baronis Time Warp. Look at that. 55 melee attack on those Temple Guards. We're going to be making solid contact against these uh, Berserkers here. Saw a decapitation there. That was awesome. Oof, and a nice solar engine blast on Throg. Here comes the uh, drop rocks of Tepok, absolutely shredding those uh, Brutes of the Hound there as they actually try and pull back a little bit. Um, 
Looks like Throg's taking a lot of damage as well. Those uh, those Star Chamber Guardians are just shredding, absolutely shredding the Soul Crusher there with the help of the uh, the Carno. Throg also just getting wrecked on here. Here comes the Searing Doom. A little bit late from the Metal Sorcerer for the support, but uh, would have liked to have seen a Transmutation of Lead to help counter that Verona's Time Warp. But man, all of the debuffs and buffs. Look at that. 145 Armor Temple Guards with 86 Melee Defense. The Aura of Pretzels stacked with... Fa's protection. Man, I'd actually... I've never seen those stacked one on top of each other before, but look at this. Immediately uh, with the Enrage here, the Feral Carnosaur actually starts going down to Throg and the Werekin. You can see how quickly they're able to turn that back around. So it had been a very favorable engagement for uh, the uh, Lizardmen. All of a sudden isn't going so great as this Feral Carnosaur gets absolutely wrecked with that Plague of Rust. And he's going to be going down. Throg now comes in. He, the Slon tried to come into body block, but this might be a big mistake at the end of the day. Or not. Or Throg might just get absolutely blasted by solar engines and actually routed by the Slon. I guess that's possible as well. Here comes Fa's protection. Up to 75 armor on the Slon. We're going to be seeing another Searing Doom get dropped here. But it looks like Double Guard and Warriors of Chakwa mostly able to pull away there. I'd like to see the... the Missile resistance, I, I, I don't know if that's on cooldown right now, but these javelins are going to be an extreme danger to the Slon, so he definitely needs to get the heck out of dodge as quick as he can. But uh, yeah, Throg getting absolutely demolished by the solar engines here. Shouldn't really surprise anyone. <laughs> and the Werekin gets bounced, absolutely bounces all the way back to the Temple Guard. That's horrible luck, man. Stands up right in the middle of anger, <laughs> and they immediately all start attacking him. Oh, man, that's the best thing I've ever seen in this game, probably. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Uh, oh, that Werekin just had the worst day of his life. <laughs> oh, he's fine, though. Apparently, he got right back at it, and that's a life lesson for all of us. You know, when you get bounced by a, by an angry Bastillodon into a horde of Temple Guard, and you stand up, and they immediately all start hitting you in the face... You know, just force path out and get straight to your objective. That's a great inspirational life lesson right there. <laughs> oh, man. That's that's great. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't, I can't even after that. Anyway, Lizardman's starting to take a little bit of a lead on the balance of power at this point as a lot of their key units... Uh, from Norska, rather, have been routed off. That Soul Crusher is probably not coming back. The Solar Engine... Solar Engines have been able to stay healthy, use up all of their ammunition here. The Skin Wolf Werekin also getting wrecked by the uh, Legion of Chakwa with their 72 melee defense, 105 armor from that Aura of Pretzels. And such a good ability, to be honest. And stacking that with the Fa's Protection to make your Saurus basically, like, into Chosen. <laughs> That's really, really cool, to be honest. I like that a lot. Um, Throg gets terrified once again because he's scared of a little Bastillodon. I mean, who wouldn't be after watching that Werekin get absolutely demolished, but... Oh, come on, Throg, get up! Wow, that get-up animation is super, super slow. <laughs> oh, it's a bad day for Norska. Yep, there goes Throg, and I think that's probably army losses. Maybe, maybe not. Looks like a few of these uh, Javelin Hunters who have actually used up all of their ammo somehow and still have not killed any of the large targets here, except I guess they did take out this... the... This, uh, what is it? Carnosaur, right? So, yeah. Now, if the Slon would move his his fat rear, then his solar engine could potentially shoot uh, Throg in the back here. But it looks like the Slon actually wants to chase Throg off, which, you know, I definitely get. Got a Banishment dropped in this back line, too, doing a ton of damage to these, uh, these uh, boys here. Javelin boys. And the Shield of the Old Ones will help prevent some of the friendly damage. Not all of it, but yeah. Throg's actually getting chased off by a Slon. I don't think I've ever seen that before, either. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. Man. A-Move definitely showing his stuff today. Good, good stuff. And that's Army Losses. GG. Well played. <laughs> oh, man. That Werekin. That Werekin getting bounced into the middle of Temple Guard, and then all of them immediately just turning. <laughs> that has to be one of my favorite moments of, of the past few weeks, to be honest. That was so good. <laughs> oh, man. Great game to both. Well played. Um, yeah, a little bit late on the support with the Metal Sorcerer there as well. Again, I would have liked to have seen Final Transmutation um, from him to help counter the Barona's Time Warp, but... 
hey, there you go. You give and, you give and take a little bit there. Uh, Solar Engines, as I mentioned, great pick in this matchup. The Feral Carnosaur didn't get any kills, but did a ton of damage to the Soul Crusher, so definitely paid for itself. But man, those Temple Guards in the front line with that Barona's Time Warp and the stacking Aura of Pretzels and uh, Paws Protection there, Saurus Warriors. Yeah, 74 kills, uh, 67 there. Great stuff, honestly. I really like the Slizzerman build quite a bit. For the Norskin side, I mean, Mass Berserkers is pretty good here. They do counter Saurus reasonably well, but they are pretty squishy. I don't like Marauder Spearman at all, though. I really think there's no place in any matchup for these guys, to be honest. You're much better off getting your anti-large from not your infantry. Um, <laughs> basically. Um, yeah, like Javelin Hunters, you've got tons of monsters with anti-large. I really think you just cheap out here and maybe upgrade some different stuff. But hey, that's just how it goes. GG. Yeah, Blizzard's buffed into God Tier worked. Yeah, that was good. That was good. Yeah, that's going to be it for today, folks. Relatively short stream, I know, but as I mentioned, I do have some other stuff to get to. But I'll be getting back to Bannerlord tomorrow and then probably doing more multiplayer streaming um over the over the weekend i think i'm probably going to do another king of the hill on saturday i want to say probably saturday morning early so uh stay tuned for that i'll be posting an announcement in the uh, dedicated tournament discord for that so be sure to keep an eye there thank you all so much for watching it's been an absolute pleasure casting some games for you guys today so uh yeah we'll see you next time bye, -bye now